Hey guys, it's Stephanie and it's been a while <laughs> since I've actually sat down in front of a camera. Uh, there's a few reasons for that. I would say probably the biggest among them is that I'm currently seven and a half months pregnant. And so right around the time I found out I was pregnant, I was just hit with this wave of fatigue and I just really didn't have energy to sit in front of a camera and do this and do all the editing and everything that goes with it. Also, along that time, I became kind of the sole runner of the Books in the Freezer podcast. So my workload on that end went up and that's kind of where I prioritized my creative book energy. So even though I haven't been here, I have been making bookish content in the form of the Books in the Freezer podcast. I'll link it down below and you can listen to it. Um, it's a horror book recommendation podcast if you're not familiar with it. And I know January is almost over, but I felt like I had to come back and make this video because this is one of my favorite videos to make. It's my favorite. It's my favorites of 2019. And I'm really excited to share these with you. These aren't necessarily books that came out in 2019. These are just books that I read in 2019, though some of them are new releases. I don't have it separated by genre. They're not ranked in any order necessarily. And like I said, there's a mix of genres. There's nonfiction, fiction, horror, mystery, thriller, everything all up in this list. So starting off is a nonfiction book called I Like to Watch, Arguing My Way Through the TV Revolution by Emily Nussbaum. She wrote a lot of television articles for The New Yorker and this book is kind of a compilation of those essays on certain television shows. So if you are like me and you love pop culture and you watch way too much TV and you are a person that has a lot of opinions about TV shows, which like, let's face it, is me as a person. Uh, this was really fun. And I really loved that she didn't just stick to the highbrow shows. Like she didn't give us yet another essay on the importance of the anti-hero vis-a-vis Tony Soprano and Don Draper and Walter White. You know, like we didn't get that essay because that essay exists times a thousand. But a lot of these articles were in defense of things that people would call lower brow shows. I was thinking like in particular, you know, she has a story in defense of the show The Good Wife, which I haven't seen, but it piqued my interest after I read her essay, an essay on the genius that was Jane the Virgin. Even though my feelings towards Gina Rodriguez right now are like an eye roll and a sigh, you know, as someone who grew up in a Spanish speaking household, watching telenovelas like Jane the Virgin was such a great show for like, I felt like such a specific demographic, but it weirdly did translate very well on the CW. And going through, I didn't necessarily agree with all of her opinions on everything. She had an essay where she talked about how she didn't like The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. And I, I did agree with a lot of her critiques, but she badmouthed Gilmore Girls and said it was too saccharine, which I'm gonna say, I hate being that person that says like, well, you just didn't get it then. But I think it is so much more than what people think it is as a show. Like I said, I have a lot of opinions on TV. Do not come for Gilmore Girls. That being said, this was a ton of fun. This I listened to on audio and it was the equivalent of like having really intense discussions about <laughs> TV with someone. And it was a lot of fun and literally just like right up my alley. So that was I Like to Watch, Arguing My Way Through the TV Revolution. Next up is a book that people have been trying to get me to read for years. Yes, Laura, I'm talking to you. I finally read it. It's Geek Love by Katherine Dunn. And this had been so hyped to me to the point that I was nervous to pick it up because what if it didn't live up to this hype that everyone is talking about? Luckily, it did. It hit like a very specific sweet spot for me. And if you don't know, um, this follows the, well, it follows two separate timelines, but I think what most people associate with the story is the Benuski family. They run a traveling carnival circus thing. They purposefully seek to have deformed children to feature as attractions in their carnival. So Mrs. Benuski ingests some harmful substances during her pregnancy and she gives birth to like a son without any limbs named Arturo and 
Olympia, who ends up being our main character and the person whose point of view we're in. She is albino and hunched back. And we're following two different timelines. Both are from Olympia's point of view. So we are following her kind of childhood timeline as she's telling us like what it was like being part of this carnival. And so that timeline is focused on like what it was like, how did this come about and different stories about growing up with her family. And then the other timeline that we are switching back and forth with is modern day where she has a job at a radio station and she lives in an apartment building uh, where her mother is the landlord, but her mother is uh, blind and like doesn't know she's there. Anyway, I'm giving a lot of details just to say that I think I, I wasn't sure the kind of tone that this book would take. And it's a very, I guess the only word I can think to describe it, it's, it's just strange, the relationship within this family and within the siblings and there rises up like a very toxic power dynamic and just the rippling effects of that alone and if you've read the book you know exactly what i'm talking about but it was at parts fascinating and yet this family who despises like normalcy and conformity but also like the price that comes with that like it was just there's a lot it actually reminded me a lot of Swamplandia which is one of my all-time favorite books and then I read an article saying that Karen Russell loves this book and now it makes sense I can see a lot of the similarities within the two books and yeah this kind of hit the Swamplandia sweet spot for me <laughs> So that was Geek Love by Catherine Dunn. Next up is another nonfiction book. This is, I never remember this title, it's way too long. Savage Appetites, Four True Stories of Women, Crime, and Obsession by Rachel Monroe. And this was recommended to me by Olive at a book, Olive. And so this is a, a true crime book that follows four different women who, and these titles are very loosely applied but one is a detective one is an advocate one is a victim and one is a killer and like I said those are loosely applied titles uh, we are following these women and kind of their stories within true crime and all of these women are just fascinating in their own way I loved the story that it opens up with which is detective and uh, I want to say the woman is named uh, Frances Glessner Lee, and I think she actually has like a nonfiction book just about her coming out this year. I will look into that and hopefully have some more information below about that. But she was this wealthy heiress who was really fascinated with forensics and um, gave a lot of money to Harvard to start like a forensics lab and unit and training and really pushed to get law enforcement in there to get this training as well. And she was just really paramount in a lot of these advances that came with forensics. But one thing that she's really known for was that she would create these doll houses that were replicas of crime scenes and like down to the detail, like the angle the bodies were at, like what the puddle of blood looked like, like what was the state of the people's clothes when they were found, like everything about these doll houses were meticulous. And they were actually used as training tools for detectives um, when coming in and observing a crime scene, like what does the angle of that body tell us and like blood spatter patterns and like all that kind of stuff. And so she just like, as a person was fascinating. So I'm definitely gonna read the book that comes out about her this year. And this book as a whole was great. Like I said, all of these women were fascinating. All of these women were fascinating. I do not have time to get into like every single story and how interesting they were. Rachel Monroe's whole thing and just really diving into true crime as a genre and why people like it, why particularly white women like it so much, and maybe also the tricky ethics that come with consuming true crime. And I just thought this was a really good thoughtful look at true crime with some interesting women. So that was Savage Appetites for, I can never remember this, Four True Stories of Women, Crime, and Obsession by Rachel Monroe. It's just too long. Next up, we have The Lost Man by Jane Harper, because of course Jane Harper, I think she's been on like every list I've done since I've started reading her books. Um, so this, I didn't know was a standalone when I went into it, because her last two books have been in the, I want to say his name is Aaron Falk series, and she's an Australian author. All of her books are set in Australia. So this takes place in the outback and we are following a man who has mysteriously died of exposure in the outback and this is mysterious because he was a local 
And if you're a local in the outback, then you know how to survive and you know how to take precautions. And that was the case with this man, like not too far from his body. His truck was there, tank full of gas, supplies, water. So how did this man who was prepared for this situation die of exposure? I just thought this story was well done. Um, like I said, Jane Harper, honestly, at this point for me, has done no wrong. She has yet to let me down. I cannot wait for the next book that she writes. And this just really gave me everything I wanted out of a crime novel, like a crime that when, you know, the story opens up, like I was scratching my head, like, I don't know, how do you even solve this crime? <laughs> and of course, like looking into it, we as the reader see the bigger picture of everything and where everything fits in. And that's just something that Jane Harper does so well. So that is The Last Man by Jane Harper.